Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. I think we should make a start. I'd like to thank uh, the organisers. I'd like to thank uh, Africa Focus, Anielis and Patrick uh, for helping to coordinate this panel on writing in African studies journals, what, how and where. This panel has become uh, something of a regular feature at ECAS and other conferences for African studies of late which reflects, I suppose, the ever-increasing significance of peer-reviewed journals in our professional worlds. The aim of this panel is a practical one, to introduce uh, how to write in peer-reviewed journals, um, to introduce a range of journals in African studies with uh, editors and members of editorial boards here uh, to do so, and to explain a little bit about how peer-reviewed journals work, to uh, explain in a kind of transparent way how the peer review mechanism operates, and perhaps to contribute to demystifying the process of uh, peer-reviewed journals. So the format for this panel um, is that I'm going to provide a brief overview. Um, I'm going to introduce some very generic points, um, more or less common to uh, all of uh, the journals represented here, in part to save time so that we don't all uh, repeat one another uh, in explaining our various mechanisms. Uh, then the journal editors uh, and members of boards themselves uh, will introduce what's specific and unique and distinctive uh, about their journals and perhaps procedures. Um, we're hoping that they'll do that in five minutes or preferably less. Um, and then we're going to open the floor, this enormous floor, <laughs> to question and answer. Um, it isn't the most interactive space, but uh, we'll have to shout and make one another heard. So my name is David Pratton, and I'm here today representing uh, Africa. Uh, but uh, I'm going to start uh, providing a kind of generic overview uh, of journals in African studies with three questions. So I'm going to break down this overview in, into three questions, reflecting the title of the panel, really. Uh, the first is what paper to publish. The second is which journal or where to publish. And the third is, how are articles published? What is the mechanism through which articles go through? So the first question is, what paper then? Um, and here I'm talking about research papers um, rather than reviews. When you flick to the back of our journals, you'll find book reviews uh, of individual books and you'll find reviews of collections of books, review articles. But what I'm addressing here um, are papers that are based on original research findings, original data. Um, this is one of the key uh, criteria for publishing uh, an article in a journal. It's that it would be based on original research findings and that, that it is not, therefore, uh, a synthesis or review of the available literature. On the whole, what we're looking for um, are papers that make a contribution, an original contribution, to a field or a debate. So it's important uh, to show the significance, the relevance of that contribution by balancing clear arguments, a clear structure in the paper, with this first and primary evidence or data uh, in the article itself. So it's important to remember that you, one needs to show editors and indeed readers, the readership of journals why they should be reading, continuing to read uh, an article. What is the significance of that particular piece? So this uh, significance of an original contribution 
um, based on primary uh, evidence is very important. But papers that are submitted to uh, journals also need to be original in another sense, and that's that they can't have been published elsewhere, and that one of the rules of uh, publishing in journals is that you can't submit a paper to more than one journal at a time. The various lengths of um, papers will vary, um, but what we're talking about in relation to original research articles are papers that are around about 8,000 words. So that is the kind of paper um, that we are uh, addressing and my colleagues from uh, different uh, journals will be able to explain specifically some of the remits um, and what they're looking for in a paper, but generically that's the type of paper. So I'm moving now to which journal, how do I choose where to publish? We were asked in a panel the other day, is there a, is there a website where I can work out uh, what, all of the, what each journal does, what, uh, where I might be able to publish my own paper um, by comparing between the different journals? And we were scratching our heads thinking, actually, there probably isn't that kind of resource. Um, how do you find out where to publish? Well, coming to panels and events like this, um, interacting with editors and publishers on the stands, uh, that's a good way of working out uh, what would be a relevant journal, what would be a relevant vehicle for publishing your work. Um, clearly also looking on publisher and journal websites to examine the editorial remit or the mission uh, statement of a particular journal is also going to be helpful to narrow down uh, where your paper will fit best. And you'll find on these websites and other information what we call notes for contributors, um, which will explain uh, the remit of, of a particular journal. And then you can look into the journal itself and see what types of articles uh, are published. And so if you're writing on a particular topic that you see has been regularly published in that journal, you can uh, be reasonably confident uh, that your own paper will fit. Um, and so what you're trying to do is to select a, a relevant audience and um, that might be distinguished between on the one hand a disciplinary audience um, and of course uh, there are many many disciplinary journals in politics, history, anthropology um, or regional and area studies uh, journals which tend on the whole and we have very various representatives of them here to be more interdisciplinary. So how you choose between where you're pitching uh, your paper uh, between a more disciplinary focused journal and an area studies uh, focused paper um, will depend on taking advice, taking advice from mentors, um, coming up with a strategy perhaps of fitting certain material from one's thesis or one's research project in some journals uh, more with a disciplinary focus, perhaps they have a more general impact, uh, making a more uh, theoretical and comparative uh, statement, uh, where um, more specific uh, uh, case study type material, where you're trying to address uh, colleagues within an African studies field uh, might be better suited to African studies journals. That's just an example of a kind of strategy where you might place different elements of your work across different journals. So that's which journal. And then finally, how are articles uh, published? What is the process? Uh, what can you expect to happen uh, in uh, submitting uh, your article? Well, the submission process itself is relatively straightforward. Um, you can find on journal uh, web pages and publishers pages the information of how and where to submit. Usually it's in electronic format. Um, that uh, website information will explain how to format the paper itself with the bibliography in a particular house style, 
uh, whether it should be uh, endnotes or, or footnotes. Um, when that document pings into our inboxes or onto our um, uh, websites to, uh, for editors to process, the editors on the whole will check, first of all, that the article fits the remit of the journal, the scope of the journal, um, fits a, a basic standard uh, expected for the journal, and fits other things like length uh, too. If it passes that kind of initial preliminary check, then we send it out to peer review. This will be therefore sent to two or sometimes more experts uh, in a relevant field. Um, as editors, we try to find the most relevant uh, experts. Often we try to mix the expertise, uh, perhaps a kind of thematic and a regional expertise. Some of the journals will use their editorial boards uh, more extensively to provide that uh, expert uh, review advice. Others will mix it with uh, external experts. So then the reviewers send in uh, their comments on the papers, um, often with a, a kind of recommendation from the reviewers themselves, often with a series of uh, uh, substantive, uh, uh, sometimes uh, critical, but um, uh, constructive, we hope, uh, comments for uh, whether the, the paper should be published, what degree of revisions should be made. And this is then uh, comes to the editors, uh, and this is where the editors earn their corn to synthesize and to um, uh, uh, send out the comments from the reviewers uh, constructively to check the kind of consistency of the reviewers' uh, comments, to provide a kind of constructive, clear advice. Sometimes uh, one reviewer might like a paper, sometimes another may not like it as much, um, but it's up to the editors to provide uh, a clear, uh, consistent set of points that an author can uh, work with uh, not simply to a, a set of contradictory uh, comments. Um, and so the editors then reply to uh, authors uh, with these readers' reports. Um, and it, it, it's at this stage that um, we will either accept a paper for publication. Uh, very rarely will a paper, though, go through this process and immediately be accepted for uh, publication. Almost 99% of the submissions we receive, if they're going to be published, will have been published on the basis of a revise and resubmit. Um, so there'll be a series of revisions that will be called for. Um, or, and unfortunately, uh, we have to do this sometimes, uh, papers will be rejected at this stage. But let me stay with the revise and resubmit and the revision process. Um, when you receive, if you receive a revise and resubmit, we mean this in a very kind of positive and constructive way. A revise and resubmit isn't a rejection. We'd be very clear on the distinction between the two. Um, and the process of revision um, can be a protracted and lengthy one. We, we like to work with our authors um, and we'll stick with you in the process of revising a paper um, in order to um, be able to publish it. Um, because we've seen potential, uh, we've seen something really fascinating and interesting in the contribution that you're making, and we'll work with you in order um, for it to, uh, to be published ultimately. So persistence is kind of a key uh, strategy uh, in this process. How long this process takes is therefore uh, kind of flexible um, in relation to the time frame Many journals will be able to publish uh, a piece that goes straight through relatively quickly, perhaps in, uh, a decision could be made in as little as a couple of months. Um, if, as you'll understand, the process of revision takes many iterations, then it can be a more protracted process. The, once an acceptance has been received, the process of production uh, to publication um, 
then has a lag, of course, itself, and can take anything from four to six months before you see your work ultimately in black and white on the page or on the screen. So I hope that's a, a, a basic overview of the process that many of the journals here um, would share. And I think from now we're going to move straight on to uh, the journals themselves. Uh, and uh, I have a list here that we're going to run through. So um, we're going to start with uh, Politique Africaine uh, and with Didier Peclard. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to this panel. Thanks, David, for the introduction. So my name is Didier Peclard. I'm one of the uh, two new um, editors of, uh, of Politique Africaine. Uh, just a few words about the journal itself. It's a new-ish, let's say, journal. Uh, in a sense that it was, it was founded in 1981 uh, by a team of researchers around uh, Jean-François Bayard, uh, with people like Jean Paul Pons, um, uh, Christian Poulon, etc., and, and other people, in an attempt, at least in the, in the, uh, in the French context of the time, to uh, refresh, renew the outlook and the way in which uh, Africa was being presented, especially uh, in, in, in politics um, journal, journal of, of political sense, or the way it was not present in, the, in journals of uh, political science. Um, I guess one of the main uh, distincting features of, of uh, Politique Africaine uh, would be the fact that it's, every issue is structured around one special feature, one special theme, uh, and dossiers as we call it. So um, uh, the dossier can be uh, on, a, on a particular topic or it can be on a particular country or an area. For instance, um, uh, in, in March, the, the um, the issue that came, came out was on the, democracy, on the DRC. Um, actually, well, this coming issue in June will be on the on the on the Sahel, uh, looking at the uh, not really the crisis, the current crisis in the Sahel, but trying to go beyond that. It's called crise chuchotement, so crisis in whispers, if you like. So, trying, with the idea of going uh, going back and going beyond the, the, the present crisis and, and looking at that. But we've had also. Uh, some topical issue. I've got here one on street parliaments, for instance, that was published last uh, October, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there was one on homosexuality in Africa in June last year, uh, and the ones that will be one on mines in, uh, uh, in October, and one on, on property and citizenship in, in December. So it's a very broad uh, range of topics in countries and areas that are, um, that are covered. But the fact that it, is, that it structures the whole uh, um, uh, the whole journey is probably one distinctive feature. In the journal, so you have about five to six maximum articles that speak to that topic or that area, plus one um, uh, longish introduction that, that kind of um, tries to bring the, the originality of the theme or, or the particular outlook on, on, on the country. But it's not only that, we also have different other sections in the journal, uh, one that comes every uh, um, uh, with every, uh, every issue is, is, is one that we simply call research, where we publish research articles uh, that uh, do not fit uh, into a particular topic or into a particular uh, area, uh, area focus, but which we think are worth publishing. So, um, well, I'll come back to the sub submission later, but just be sure that it's not just about the, the special issue. Uh, we also have a section uh, that we call the uh, uh, conjoncture, which is um, about current political issues. Uh, there will be one, for instance, an article by Roland Marshall on Chad um, in, uh, in June. So it doesn't happen necessarily every time, but if you, have, if you feel like you have the, uh, something to say about something that is currently happening, a crisis or whatever, particular uh, in, in Africa and you have new material based on, 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 on field research then it's also worth contacting us to, um, to propose something because we are always on the lookout for uh, articles that speak to a uh, very burning issue at, uh, of the moment. Then uh, we also have well book reviews of course but maybe another thing that, uh, that we, we, we enjoy doing is uh, what we called uh, Débat autour d'un livre, so we pick up, pick up one book that we think is particularly important, uh, ask three, in general three to maximum four um, experts of that uh, particular field to provide an outlook on, a critical outlook on a longish uh, review about uh, 15,000 characters, it's about, uh, oh, I don't know how much it is in words, but anyway, a long, a long uh, book review if you like, 
that engages with a book from a comparative perspective, from a conceptual theoretical perspective, it depends, and then we give the author the chance to, um, to answer the, um, the, 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 the three or four reviews and so that you, you really get a sense of, of why this book is so, so particular and what uh, the different topics that it, that, that it addresses. Again, this doesn't happen every time, but, but we try to do it regularly also. Um, in terms of our disciplinary focus, I mean, obviously, uh, the title itself, Politic African, kind of hints towards the fact that it was born out of, say, of, 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 of political science, but it's certainly not a, uh, a typical political science journal as, as, uh, as we would uh, uh, understand that nowadays. It's very interdisciplinary. Uh, we publish uh, articles uh, that come from political scientists, from anthropologists, from, from historians, from sociologists, demographers, geographs. So it's really, it's really very open. But there needs to be, of course, a focus on something that is re relevant to, to politics in, in, in Africa in general. We publish also mainly in French. Uh, uh, all the articles of the uh, special feature of each issues are uh, published in French, but they can also be submitted in other languages. Uh, English, obviously, but we've had also some submissions in, in Portuguese and uh, German. I can't think of any submission lately, but, uh, but at least, well, the usual submissions are either, either, either in French or in English, and we do translate them into French for the, um, for the main uh, thematic part of the, of the, of the issue. And then uh, in the other sections, especially the, what we call the research section, we, we've been publishing um, uh, articles in, in English regularly. So again, it is possible to submit things in other languages than, than French. Um, how to, to publish in, in, in Politica again? I think, well, all that David just said about the, about the, 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 the type of paper and the, and the quality of the paper, what we expect of the quality, I think holds true for us too, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. But since we have uh, that, uh, um, that, that particularity of having a special topic or a region in each uh, issue, the way to, uh, to find out about that is to um, go regularly on our website and to look out for the call for papers. We have uh, each time for each issue, there is a call for paper that circulates in French and English. Uh, it's on our website, it also circulates on, on various lists, Age Africa and others. Uh, and then uh, look out for that, and then submit. Usually, the typical um, the typical situation is you uh, submit a proposal to the guest editor. Yeah, this, I forgot to say. Also, each uh, special issue is generally uh, coordinated by a guest editor. The guest editor can be from the editorial board, not necessarily. Uh, often, they are not. Uh, and so, you submit uh, a proposal to um, the. the guest editor who will select it together with the editorial board and then you will, you will be asked eventually to, uh, to submit a full paper which will then go into the, uh, into the usual review process through the editorial board plus uh, outside, uh, outside reviewers. Um, but you can also, since we have topics every time, you can also uh, submit proposals for special issues if you have a, uh, a topic or research project that's been going on for a couple of years and, and you feel you've got good results and you'd like to share them, uh, you can also send us a proposal for a special issue on a particular topic and then we will evaluate it and then, and then see if it fits So if it doesn't and then again then go through the, the process that I've just explained, just explained with the, the call for papers etc. So in a sense if you have a research project with a couple of papers you, and you want to submit it, usually uh, we don't just take a uh, a full issue, we usually we do go through the call for papers to try and, and extend it. So, uh, but that's also a matter of, 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 of negotiation and of, of discussion with us. We're, we're open to, um, to all sorts of different arrangements. Um, and then again, you can submit anytime a research article or an uh, article of conjecture, uh, of, of um, current, current political affairs. Uh, what we expect of the papers, we put a strong emphasis on two things. One is, is field work, uh, so we do want to have original pieces based on uh, extensive field work in, uh, in a particular African countries, and we also um, put a lot of emphasis on, on, on the argument that doesn't necessarily have to, has to be a very conceptual, theoretical, it can be also, because that's one of the ambitious, um, ambitions of the journalist to really participate to, um, um, to conceptual d debates about 
African studies, but beyond also, so that's important. But more important than, than being theoretical is, is having a clear argument. I think that's something, when papers are rejected, usually it's because they, they seem to be going nowhere, basically. You read it, you don't have any idea of what the actual, uh, the actual uh, intent, the actual objective of the author was. So constructing, it's very basic, but it's always very important to repeat, but constructing a paper around a clear argument is, is very important, and making sure that the, that the field work, that the, uh, that the actual concrete reality behind it is, is visible is also uh, very important. Yeah, and I think I will stay there. Okay. Thank you very much, Didier. Uh, we're now going to turn to African Affairs and to Nick Cheeseman. Thanks, David. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Nick Cheeseman. Uh, I'm the editor of African Affairs, along with Rita Abrahamson, who's sitting down here. She may wave at you or be shy. No, she's waving. <laughs> uh, what can we tell you about African Affairs? I guess the first thing that we would put up front is that we're the number one journal in African studies. We have the highest impact factor over five years of any journal in area studies. And what that basically means for people who don't know very much about impact factors is that it means your work's getting very widely read and very widely cited. So the big pitch for African Affairs would be that we're a great place to publish if you want your work to have a big impact, if you want it to be very widely read. What else do we have to attract you to African Affairs? Well, we have an African Author Prize that we're very proud of um, for the best paper published by someone either an African institution or a PhD student at um, an overseas university. The prize is awarded every two years um, and it includes a cash prize of £500 and also an airfare and um, expenses for the winning candidates to come to uh, the ASA conference in the United Kingdom. So we're always keen to promote African scholarship to encourage young African scholars to send uh, their papers to us and that prize is one of the things that represents our commitment to that. We also sponsor other prizes, for example at the African Politics Conference Group, we sponsor a prize that they give out every year for the best paper presented at the ASA uh, conference and the APSA conference in the United States of America. What is distinctive about the way that we actually se select papers? What is the African Affairs kind of remit? Uh, much like our colleagues have been saying, we accept a very broad range of papers. We're interested in economics, in sociology, in international relations, in political science. The main thing that we look for in our papers, though, is that they have contemporary relevance. So we don't publish historical papers. But outside of that, we published a broad range of papers. If you look at our papers recently, we've published on the impact of witchcraft, we've published on the political use of music in Côte d'Ivoire, we've published on China and Africa relations, and we've published classic electoral studies. So it's a really broad range of papers. Much like you were saying about Politik Afriken, what we're interested in is the kind of politics of those processes, the relevance of those things to how we understand Africa today. In terms of what we like to see in a paper, exactly as David has said, the number one thing for us is an original contribution. The contribution may come in a number of different ways. You may allow us to understand a country that's been misunderstood in the literature in a new light. You may have a theoretical contribution to an old, stale debate that transforms it and makes it new. So the contribution can come in a number of variety of ways, but for us in African Affairs, we're very unlikely to publish something if we don't feel that it has a significant original contribution. Along with that, we're also looking for papers really that are able to pick out the broader impact of the paper. So it may be a fantastic case study of one country, but the ability to then reflect on what that means for how we study that topic, for how we think more broadly about African politics, African international relations. A great example of this kind of work would be someone like James Ferguson's work in the anti-politics machine, right, where you start off with a case study of Lesotho, but you're able to understand the wider implications of that for other issues. And we're particularly attracted to that because of our very broad audience. It's great to have articles that are able to see and connect small debates and case studies to wider issues. Our general focus in terms of our ethos is that we try to edit rather than police the field. In other words, we very much follow our reviewers. If our reviewers think something's great and we're not so sure, we'll go with the reviewers, and vice versa. So we're very much driven by the review process and the feedback we get from the experts. We try and have everything turned around by three months. African Affairs historically has had a kind of policy of not backing up articles, which means that if you get an article accepted, you won't have to wait a year or two to get it published in hard copy. We usually turn things around so that accepted articles come out within the next two to three issues. 
very quickly. Um, and we try and have an answer for all of our review, uh, our authors, within around about three months. Of course, as all of my colleagues will know, that's completely dependent on reviewers. And some reviewers are much easier to keep to time than others. Like Politique Africaine, we publish both articles and briefings. So articles are typically around 8,000 words, and there we're really looking for an original contribution. Briefings are different. We're looking really for an excellent summary of a recent event that's high profile, topical, and perhaps hasn't yet been explained particularly well in the scholarly literature. For example, we've just published a series of excellent briefings on uh, Mali by three different authors, each of which gives us a new perspective on the Malian crisis. So if you've got ideas for briefings, 3,500 words, shorter pieces, which provide updates of recent events of particular significance, then please do get in touch with us. And one thing that we would say, and I'm sure this is probably true of all of the people here, is that we're happy to have informal, um, uh, happy to have informal inquiries. We're happy for people to contact us and ask us if a paper they've written might be the kind of piece that we would be interested in. And if you do that, we can often give you feedback very quickly, within, say, 12 uh, to sort of 12 hours or 74 hours, on whether or not we think that sort of thing should be submitted to us to go under review. And that means in just a space of a few days, you can get a sense of whether or not it will be suitable, which means that we don't waste your time by putting things into the review process that we think are unlikely to work for the journal. What would my tips be on getting your work actually accepted by a journal, and in particular African affairs? I think one thing which echoes what's just been said is to have a very clear argument, but also to put it up front. Don't bury the argument in the middle of the paper. Don't have it coming out just in the conclusion. Get your argument out there explicitly and clearly right from the introduction so that we can see exactly what you want to say, but also the roadmap for how you're going to say it. The second thing is to actually look at the style guide of the journal before you submit the article, not after you submit the article. And also to think a little bit about the sorts of pieces that have been published in the past. If you pick up a copy of African Affairs, and we have some copies here for you to take away for free if you'd like to have a sample, you'll see that papers tend to be formatted in a certain way. Arguments tend to be made in a certain way. If you want to publish in African Affairs, it makes sense to consider that, to consider the type of articles that have been uh, published in the past, the way that those articles have been made uh, and put together, and the way that you can perhaps make your argument a little bit more like that. Um, as I said, we have free copies here. We also have flyers here, which give you three months of free access to African Affairs, so that you can access all of our journals and all of our publications and see the kind of material in the past that we've published and see whether your sort of work is the sort of work that we generally publish. And as David said so well earlier, that's one of the best um, examples, the best clues as to whether or not your work fits a journal. Are you citing pieces from that journal in your own article? So, in short, publish of African Affairs, because we're the number one journal in African Studies, we publish a range of contemporary <coughs> issues, but not the same. Uh, we don't do special issues, I'm afraid. We are often approached, but we don't do them as a policy, so uh, please don't approach us with special issues, although we know they're fantastic. Um, and please do come down and take our free samples and also uh, our free access to the journal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. We're now turning to the Journal of Southern African Studies, and we have two people presenting, Eust Fontaine and David Simon. Um, good morning. Can you hear me? Alright, um, yeah, I'm Joseph Fontaine, I'm one of the editors of the Journal of Southern African Studies. Over there we have David Simon, who's the chairman of our editorial board. Um, JSAS is different to other journals here in a couple of respects, and one, the, the most obvious one is that we're a sub-regional journal, so we focus on, on Southern Africa, but that doesn't mean, um, well, the interesting factor out of that is that we're also one of the largest journals. We publish regularly between 11 and 14 papers in an issue. Um, and we're interdisciplinary, we cover history, anthropology, political science, geography, and so on. Um, but the other unique thing about JSIS is that we work on a very editorial board basis. So most of our reviewing takes place within either our editorial or our advisory board. So that means that, in a sense, we have a, a specialization of all the expertise from the region working within JSAS, and that means that when you submit your papers, it gets reviewed by the experts in the field. We publish four issues a year, we have one special issue a year, and we publish uh, papers and reviews and review articles. Um, what else do I need to say? We have a, a prize for the best new author, 
every year, the Terence Ranger Prize. And we have money to use to um, sponsor attendances at conferences. So quite often someone would submit a proposal, uh, say, for a special issue which is tied to a conference. And if we uh, are sort of keen on that and support that, then we might suggest, look, do you want to put in a proposal for some funding to bring, say, an African scholar from an African institution to come to the conference and so on. One of the key things, I think, like all the journals here, is that we spend a lot of time working with authors to make papers. So one of the questions that we often ask is not, is this a good paper, but could this be a good paper? That's one of the key things that we discuss in our editorial board meetings, because um, typically the process is the paper is submitted, it gets sent for review, um, as an editor, I then uh, collect the review reports from the reviewers and then we have a meeting and we discuss each paper at length in the editorial board meeting. And the kinds of things we'll be discussing would be not just, you know, is this a good paper as it is, but can we see something in this paper that would make it a, a valuable contribution to uh, scholarship on the region and African studies more generally. And, and this means that we do an, an awful lot of work with authors. And because most papers, like David said earlier, uh, most papers that are published in, I, I expect most journals here, actually are accepted on the basis of revisions. Actually, this is a very important point, that this emphasis on, on working with authors to produce the best possible article out of the piece. Um, the other thing, like all the other journals, it's important that you make an original contribution but I think JSAS has a particular empirical streak. So we like original research material. And I think the, the key issue here is that we want analysis over theory. It's not that we're not a theoretical journal. The point is that we're more interested in original analysis of empirical material than we are of a sort of very theoretical or a very technical kind of a paper. Also, we are looking for the, the long-term impact so African Affairs uh, makes a lot of emphasis on producing very contemporary papers. JSAS, on the other hand, is looking for the kind of a paper that will continue to have an impact, will continue to be relevant in five or even ten years' time. And, and so we're looking for, a, a, we're on a kind of longer trajectory of, of interest. Um, also, if you're interested, thinking about publishing with us, I suggest you look at what we've published already because we try, because of this longer, uh, this longer historical emphasis, we try to sort of draw on things we've already published, emerging and continuing debates. So one of the things that we've innovated fairly recently is the, these editorials. And it's uh, one of the tasks as editor that I enjoy doing most, which is we have a, a collection of, of general papers. We have to pull them together into a coherent whole. And so we, the edit editors who's, who's leading on an issue will, will try and order the papers and try and make sense of them in terms of the longer durée of what we've been publishing. And we've put these are on our website, they're also free to view, so you can download them. And they give you a sense of, of how we see the different papers in a general issue, how they come together, how they contribute to, to longer debates. And in fact, I've got a couple of printouts here of, of a recent one that I wrote, which, which I, you know, I can hand out to you if you're interested. Um, I'm not sure if I've... David, do you want to add anything to this? I'll just add a couple of things. Your thanks, yeah. Um, and although... As, as you said as introductory comments, our region of concern is Southern Africa. We interpret that fairly flexibly. If you look in the cover or the website, the blurb says effectively we look at the, the SADC region. Um, and as everybody knows, the number of members of SADC has changed over the years, so we're, we're suitably flexible. But if, for example, you are doing research in Tanzania, you'd be well advised to think what your primary intended audience is in making a decision whether to submit that article to JSAS or one of the East African or, or Africa-wide journals or indeed a, a more disciplinary focused journal. Similarly, we do occasionally receive and consider and actually publish on, on Madagascar, but crucially also, and I think this is a point worth making, um, we, we're not obsessed, as it were, with the region so that if you are comparing something in part of or the whole of Southern Africa with another region or even somewhere else altogether, we've 
published one or two sort of benchmark pieces comparing histories of environmentalism in South Africa and the USA, for example, in relation to national parks, trajectories, wilderness areas, conceptions, where there are very clear contrasts and comparisons. Or land policy in one or more Southern African countries and somewhere else. We will consider it carefully in the sort of way that the DOS described and, and treat it sympathetically. Um, equally, we're, like many of the other journals represented here, very happy to consider work that looks at relationships between part or all of Southern Africa and the wider world. So Chinese engagement or increasingly Indian engagement with Southern Africa or, or histories of mobilities and flows of one sort or another between India, China, wherever, and one or more parts of the region would be entirely appropriate for us to consider. Um, we're also, as, as you just alluded to, but let me just elaborate a little bit, uh, very keen to help authors, particularly working in the region and particularly in institutions or even as independent researchers who do not have access to the entire oeuvre of, of published work in university libraries or uh, bespoke uh, restricted online archives and so on. So we do spend a lot of time engaging with authors. Uh, we participate very actively and have led several other writing workshops held in Southern Africa uh, through the African Studies Association of the UK and other formats where we help people uh, in, in the sense that you just described um, in terms of getting material from a thesis or, or postdoctoral work into publishable form. One other general comment that um, complements the, the sort of opening remarks that, that David made was do, when you submit to a journal, whichever one it is, check the format and particularly the bibliographic and referencing style. Because very unfortunately, for historical reasons, each and every journal here and beyond this table has a slightly different or indeed a fundamentally different, in some cases quite unique, uh, style of referencing. Sometimes it's the Harvard or the Chicago and Believe me, there is no one half and no one Chicago style. There are umpteen variants on a theme. JSAS uses footnotes, and again, there's a particular style. Details are on the website and the instructions for authors. And it's very frustrating as editors if we receive something that is obviously written either without any consideration of that or, in a sense, simply resubmitting something that perhaps didn't work somewhere else, but you haven't even changed into the house style and, and the referencing system. Because it will simply come back saying, we can't publish it, even if we like it, until such a time as you comply with our overall style requirements. Um, the other thing I should say is that we publish not only entire special issues, but we're happy to consider proposals for what we call a part special issue. In other words, if you're organizing a conference, or indeed a panel at this conference, and you're not expecting to have 10 or 12 papers of publishing quality, but perhaps five or six, that would constitute what we call a part special issue. And we would expect you to submit a considered um, rubric of two or three pages and the outline and the titles and the sort of abstract for each one. And again, as we do with all the papers, we consider that in the round at our meetings, which are held quarterly, usually in London, but occasionally at the African Association Conference or whatever it is. Um, we also will consider clusters, which are effectively two or three papers that are thematically linked, either from a conference session or that we've compiled because we happen to have had two or three papers submitted independently, but which work very well together. We might even then engage with the authors to enhance the interrelationships and the complementarities. Um, I have been working um, with Jerry Dory um, and colleagues at Taylor and Francis, both on behalf of JSS and the Review of African Political Economy, at the forefront of the revolution that is well nigh upon us now in relation to open access and what this means for changing practices in the world of publishing. It's a very rapidly moving field, but again, if you are particularly interested in that, look at the website. Each journal has a slightly different policy, uh, but Jay Sass and several others represented here um, are at the moment in the sort of what we might call hybrid stage, where we're prepared not only to publish in the traditional way, um, which is the subscription model, where authors pay nothing, but if you would like your paper as of today to be instantly available upon publication globally free of charge, we have the facility um, for an article processing charge to be paid, and then even if the papers surrounding it in an issue are restricted, your paper um, will appear under open access. We might, in 
the future, of course, change that as the field and the funding models supported by um, publishers or universities or funding councils change, we, we will keep this under review. But that's pretty much all I wanted to say at the moment. Thanks very much. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now moving to the Journal of Modern African Studies and to Martine Walsh. what your 
paper is about, what, your, what, what the unique argument is, then perhaps there's something wrong in, in the way you're you know, approaching your paper. So you want that clarity that you can put it on a postage stamp and explain it to a non-specialist. So um, I, I'll, I'll leave it there on um, JMAS. I'll just uh, hold up two more journals, um, and there's literature here about them. Uh, the Journal of African History um, has recently had a cover change. Uh, so out with the drum, and in with the, uh, the deep red and orange. Um, again, 10,000 words maximum. You will find, you know, read the instructions for contributors. Um, I won't go into great detail. Um, and finally, a journal uh, of African law. This comes out of SOAS. Um, interested, obviously, in, in contemporary uh, legal issues. Um, they can be issues of international and comparative significance. That's what you know, we, we want. Um, human rights, international development. Again, leaflets here and um, lots of free access on the website. Read. <laughs> You've got the message. Uh, thank you very much, Martin. So now we turn to Africa, the journal of the International African Institute, and to my co-editor, Karen Baba. Did anybody hear what I just said? Yes. Yes? Okay, so I can continue. But distinguished not only for being orange, but also for being one of the oldest journals in the field. It was founded in 1928 and is the Journal of the International African Institute, which has played a very long and um, distinguished has a very long and distinguished history of promoting scholarship on in and about Africa, and with particular emphasis on African um, intellectual and creative production, which is a tradition that we have tried to live up to in the work of the journal. It's a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary journal covering all areas of the African humanities and social sciences, but with a strong focus on what we call life on the ground in Africa, which basically involves a broadly ethnographic approach, an approach that looks at problems, issues, events um, on a human scale, involving actual people. So it, it needs you to have done original fieldwork or archival work to bring new material, as all the other journals also require and new interpretations and ideas about that material. Um, we do a special issue every year, um, which will be edited by guest <coughs> editors, proposed by guest editors and sub-edited by them. And like JSAS, we also do themed part issues. So if you have a small clump of papers that you think go well together, um, you are very welcome to propose them as a part issue. One of the things that we do, which we are keen on drawing to your attention, is a strand of the journal that we have called the local intellectuals strand, the African local intellectuals strand. And this is a series of pieces which are intended to retrieve and bring to a new audience the work of African thinkers and writers or composers of, of ideas who are outside the academic mainstream, whose publications or, or whose productions have not got into the um, official sphere of publication, so they would not be available normally um, through the normal channels. So it could be, things, could be things like people's memoirs, notebooks, local histories, um, newspaper articles, 
any kind of text which you think is very, very interesting, but which has not, is not readily accessible to a wider academic audience. So the format we use is that the, the scholar who's introducing us to the African local intellectual will write a short piece of about 5,000 words introducing them, and then we'll have a 5,000 word excerpt from the local intellectual's work. That's in the print version of the journal, but in the online version of the journal, you can include as much of the local intellectual text as you want. So it could be an entire book if you want to do that, or you know, a whole series of articles from a newspaper, a long oral text which you have transcribed, and translated and annotated. Pictures, audio, uh, video can all be included in the online version. So it's a way of representing material which might not readily find an outlet as a standard article or as a book, because quite often publishers would not accept this kind of material as a book because it wouldn't be thought of as having a, a big enough commercial prospect. So that's one of the um, things we'd like you to bear in mind when considering what type of paper and what journal to submit it to. Uh, another thing we're anxious for you to know is that we accept, we consider papers in French and yesterday at our editorial board meeting we also decided to consider papers written in Portuguese in honour of this wonderful conference in Lisboa. However, we don't publish them in French and in Portuguese. If, if the paper passes muster and if we want to, to publish it, we will then get it translated into English so that the text will reach an Anglophone audience, much of which, as you know, to our sorrow, is monoglot. However, the original French or Portuguese version will be published alongside the English one in the online journal, so you have it both ways. Um, I think that's most of what I want to say about Africa. David, do you want to add anything? It's okay. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, now we turn to Africa Focus and Patrick Van Dam has PowerPoint, that's right. Okay, you'll um, hopefully see um, some slides appear soon. I'm basically old school and I try to um, subtend what I'm saying by uh, pictures. I like pictures myself. So uh, Africa Focus is the um, journal that um, emanates from the uh, Africa platform of the, what is now the association because it's also university colleges and not only the University of Ghent in uh, Flanders, Belgium. Um, I heard already many times multidisciplinary, but you'll see this is really a multi-multi one. I myself am an agronomist with uh, some ethno-botanical inclinations and I'm also teaching economy. So um, in that respect the journal is like reflecting a bit that kind of philosophy. It's international, double-blind, peer-reviewed. There's two uh, issues a year. June and December, and as we speak, uh, the number is being sent out, but it's also put in uh, open access mode on the website. And so we exist since uh, 85. Um, since uh, 2008, we have the same uh, kind of uh, color that my neighbor is now uh, having on her front page of one of her journals. So you see the background there, uh, orange for the title, and then some reddish moon landscape kind of uh, background on the front page. So um, we are open access and it's free. So there's no charge to the uh, authors. There's nothing to be paid. And it's also um, direct. So the day that we come off the printer with our hard copy, it's also put on the website. 
And we have put everything that we ever published, so back to the early years, on the website. So all previous articles uh, that were still like stenciled, so to speak, are on the website now and can be accessed for free as well. Um, apart from that, we try to uh, recoup some of the uh, costs by having a traditional subscription mode. So we have some people who subscribe and, and pay. Um, so I'm one of the two uh, chief editors. We have our editorial board and peer review system. I should stress that we, because we are a university uh, and, and the journal is published via and through and based on the university, we try to uh, invite papers of young scholars. So we see ourselves as like the first kind of journal in which you want to publish. Um, this being said, we also have like uh, older people and people who have been in the trade for a long time, but we try to uh, stimulate younger researchers to have like a first try with their articles in our journal. This being said, we peer review at a normal pace, but sometimes it can be longish if you think that there is potential for the article, but the wording, the way it is presented by the author is not yet what it should be, maybe. We are, um, as you can see, on the directory, and um, we also have an ISSN number. Um, all content is always available in full text, either hard or soft. Um, we have color photos if you want to, uh, black and white, everything that uh, gives you like your complete or, or a way that you can completely express yourself through uh, your article. So here you see a list which is not limitative of the uh, domains in which we have been publishing. Um, so they are really alpha, beta, gamma. We are not um, confining ourselves. There is um, free um, digital file of your published paper, of course, accessible by everyone. There's no restriction for use. Um, so once it's published, it's really open domain. We also share and we have alerts via Twitter and Facebook so that the audience can be quite broad. Uh, basically, we publish in English and French. Um, we even have Dutch, but that's like... A, for book reviews. There's no word limit, uh, but we like to have high quality and quick editorial review. It's uh, indexed by the ProQuest International Bibliography of Social Sciences and uh, is thus accredited by a number of African education departments. So here you see uh, the website and you can also send mails direct to info at africafocus.eu. So we welcome all your suggestions and articles. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, so now we're turning to Africa, Spec Africa Spectrum and to Katja Wertmann. Yes, hello everybody. Um, we, I represent Africa Spectrum. I'm on the editorial board of Africa Spectrum. And uh, this is the, the, the only Germany-based African Studies journal. And it belongs to a journal family uh, that is published by the German Institute of Global and Area Studies. The journal is, as all the others mentioned, uh, multidisciplinary, we receive contributions from political science, economics, anthropology, history, religious studies, even linguistics. Um, the journal is also listed in the major indexes such as SSI, CI or ISI. And uh, a couple of years ago, some major decisions were taken by the German Institute of Global and Area Studies concerning its journal family, um, which was first there will be only publications in English. Before Africa Spectrum used to be trilingual, the publications were in English, German, and French. Now it's only English. And the second major decision was to go open access. 
Uh, and as for Africa Focus, uh, this is uh, immediate open access as soon as uh, publications, as papers are accepted and revised and uh, ready to publish. They will, be, uh, they will appear in a print version and in an online version at the same time, and there is no fees for authors. Uh, we have an international advisory board, and we are also collaborating with the German African Studies Association and the Swedish Hammarskjöld Foundation. Our review process has two steps. We normally have a first screening of submissions within the editorial board, where we'll, we will decide which papers will make it into the review process. And at that stage, um, we, we distinguish between uh, several kinds of papers. We have research articles, and then we also have analysis and reports and contributions to debates. And the research articles are the ones that will go to the, to the reviewers. And at this first step, uh, we may propose to some authors to turn a research article that we think will not make it through the review process to turn it into a shorter, shorter analysis or report contribution which will, not go, which, will, which will not go to external reviewers, it will be reviewed within the editorial board. And the, the research articles, which as all others, uh, need to be original, need to make a relevant contribution to a discipline or a topic, and uh, need to be based on empirical research preferably, uh, these will go to, the, to two external reviewers, and if the reviewers completely disagree, one says accept and one says reject, it will go to a third reviewer. Um, I won't say anything else about the quality of papers, that's about the same as everybody else already mentioned. Um, but uh, one thing that we uh, re realized when, after we got open access is that Africa Spectrum has become much more visible and that is something that shows in the download statistics. So uh, you can see easily how that has increased over the years. Um, and I will just briefly tell you what the top 10 downloads were. Um, two articles on Boko Haram in northern Nigeria and some other more politically oriented papers about power sharing. Uh, we had a special issue about power sharing uh, or about national identity in the South Sudanese media discourse or uh, a paper about post-apartheid South African state. So. Um, if you have a really relevant topic this will, uh, for your research article and you publish it with Africa Spectrum, this will show in the download statistics, which means that people all over the world uh, have access to this and download it and know about your work. Uh, we, you, we, we, we are doing both general issues that are not focused on one topic and we, we've been doing special issues, but we are currently considering not doing special issues anymore. Um, and we, uh, yeah, I think we have a, um, just, just to, for a brief impression, between the 1st of January 2012 and currently we received about 150 contributions of which we had to reject 90 after the review process and uh, the others are published or are in the pipeline. Uh, the topics are very various. Uh, just recently we have, uh, in our latest issue for instance, we have uh, one article about transitional justice and there's another in, in Malawi and there's another in, in, the pipeline, in, in Burundi and there's another in the pipeline about Uganda, but we also had uh, papers about multilingualism and hip-hop consumption in Nigeria. We have a debate section where we have uh, one contribution to which other authors reply. So we have recently had a debate about land rights in Kenya in particular and more generally in Africa. And we currently have a debate uh, where people have reacted to a piece by Francis Nyamjo on the future of anthropology in South Africa and in general, uh, which is a very controversial piece. And in the current issue, four or five people have replied to that. So if you, if you are interested in having a look at that, go on our website where you can find all the contributions and all other information as well. Thank you. Katia, okay, thank you very much. Uh, we now turn to the Journal of Critical African Studies and to Wolfgang Zeller. Morning, everyone. I'm one of the four editors of this journal. And actually, uh, another one is sitting over there because Joost Fontaine is also one. 
Um, this uh, journal has been recently relaunched with Taylor and Francis. Um, Jerry is sitting there. He approached us in Uppsala at the last ICAS conference, and we had discussed this already previously. And Taylor and Francis invited us to join them in their cohort of journals. And uh, since we have decided to do that after a quite intense uh, discussion among the editors, um, and also our chairman, Paul Nugent, whose female version is over there. Um, we uh, have now quite a bit more momentum behind what we're doing. We, uh, we have actually also an editorial assistant, so um, we are now a fully running, fully peer-reviewed African Studies journal. We are, um, of course, a very young journal still in this cohort of, you know, big, uh, slightly older fish perhaps, which are surrounding me and intimidating me here, but I think we have no reason to be intimidated anymore. Um, we are really well on our way to becoming a established journal. Um, however, we retain a certain youth. Uh, I just tried to calculate. I think our average uh, age of editors is around 35 years. And um, I think that is a good thing in many ways. <laughs> and uh, I definitely think that for younger scholars, this is uh, a journal that is very interesting to consider for various reasons. Um, first of all, as I said, it is fully peer reviewed. Uh, you have to uh, be up to the highest standards and we are very, very thoroughly running the uh, editorial process and the peer review process. Um, but we also have a very quick turnover and we intend to keep it that way. Um, we are also approachable in person because we are always out there in conferences, the four of us, I should by the way mention the other two editors who are not sitting here are um, Lisa Bischoff from the University of Glasgow and um, uh, Alexander Ferris Fort, who is now he's in the University uh, in Leeds. And as I said, Joost is there. So if you want to uh, come to us uh, and uh, propose something that you want to get published, you can always do it in places like this and talk to us. Of course, there's an official process via our website, which is pretty easy to find. And you should definitely read the instructions. They're very clear and very strict, as in all other cases. So you can bypass that. Uh, I would say perhaps in terms of the referencing style, uh, you shouldn't be too intimidated. Uh, you know, it's okay to check with us if there's any chance of getting this published at all before you do all that work. Uh, you will have to do it though to get it published. Um, we have, just to sort of add to the point that we're not just some sort of uh, young upstarts, we have a, I think, pretty illustrious and pretty serious advisory board. Peter Kishir is on it. Um, you can have a look at the advisory board list uh, on the front page. So we make good use of this board, also in terms of the editorial process. And um, we are an open access journal in Sub-Saharan Africa, most of Sub-Saharan Africa at the moment. Now I'm looking at Jerry, who is strictly looking back at me. Uh, this is, uh, as we've heard, an issue that is sort of under um, debate and under review. We are also running this hybrid system of having um, advanced payment for instance open access worldwide or the uh, older model but we have insisted when we entered the contract that there is uh, a possibility for Africans to access this journal as easily and as cheaply as possible and then we definitely hope that this will stay this way. So there's a little bit of pressure on Jerry now but we of course know that this is a field that's much bigger than us uh, we try to keep a tap on this. Um, I haven't perhaps said um, that what actually are the criteria then of what we like to publish. Well, we publish papers from all the social science disciplines, so we welcome them. Uh, we welcome contributions on all regions of Africa. Uh, I should also mention that we are publishing three times a year at the moment. And um, we have a bit of a, I wouldn't say corporate philosophy because I think that's a stupid way of putting it, but there has been some serious discussion of course of well, what makes critical African studies uh, different from all the others. And I can perhaps cite briefly here something from our little statement, uh, recognizing that scholarly approaches to the African continent are often problem based, meaning like there is a problem, but empirically strong. This publication seeks to encourage adventurous theoretical development and accounts of positive everyday experiences and an application of the long view. So to translate this back to you, perhaps, if you've done research and you've come up with something that is, you know, not 
dull and not depressing, perhaps going in an interesting direction. <laughs> uh, that's also very, very welcome, you know. We're, we don't like to see things that are normatively saying hurrah, and uh, we've had some interesting suggestions for publications on that as well. Uh, it has to be very critical, uh, theoretically strong, but uh, we're very interested in things that show things that are going right or could be going right. Um, we have Facebook and Twitter account, and we use those actually very extensively, so we definitely update that uh, frequently with whatever is coming out and other things. Um, so we've got quite a lot of people following those, and I'm quite sure that that will be quite an important thing in the long-term future in terms of how your potential publications with us get seen. One thing I should still say, perhaps, is that at the moment, and also most certainly in the mid to long term future, we are very interested in special issues. So we are one of the journals that definitely actually encourages special issues, especially if there is a guest uh, editor that will work with the editorial team to bring this to fruition. So if you have a conference panel and you want to perhaps get some of those papers uh, out there, then I think we're a pretty good address. Uh, our current issue is a special issue on African borderlands. The next one coming up will be on history through arts, the one after that on human substances, and we've got one on modernity and patronage in the pipeline as well. Um, of course, we accept individual papers and we very much encourage them, but um, as I said, special issue is most welcome. Joost, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, I, think, I think you've covered it really. No, I mean, I, I, I guess. Um, what I would emphasize is the critical. By critical, we mean, uh, you know, in an analytical sense. So when we put the journal together, when we were thinking, we were saying, look, we need, African studies needs to move to the center of theoretical innovation in the different disciplines involved in it. Because too often we felt that the you know, African studies, as it was manifesting itself, tended to um, be follow on from theoretical innovation in its respective disciplines rather than be leading it. And so that was one of the key motivations for setting up the journal was to say let's make African studies in each of its constituent disciplines lead theoretical and critical innovation. And that really is one of the key motivations of, of the project. I think that's all I would add. Thank you very much. We have two uh, further journal presentations. Um, so I'm turning now to African Studies Review and to Peter Kashir. Do you want to come up here? Sorry to add another journal to this very, very long list and uh, to push in all at the end. Uh, but thanks to the, or thanks, uh, to the organizers to allow me to get in. Probably uh, African Studies Review was not on the list because we are mostly American-based, while all the other journals here are mostly European-based. But uh, we are very interested also in Europe. Uh, the editors are all, uh, and in Africa, of course. The, all the editors are all based in uh, America, Elliot Franken, uh, Sean Redding, and uh, Mitchy Goheen. Uh, we are very closely associated with the uh, African Studies Association in the US. Uh, but uh, recently, so the, the, the journal is very much uh, related to membership of the African Studies Association in uh, the US. But recently, we made a move to uh, Cambridge University Press, uh, that's becoming a kind of powerhouse for all uh, journals on Africa. Our profile is, um, well, we can say this is American orange, this is a different kind of orange again. We have all variations of orange. Uh, the, um, as the most of the journals, uh, we, are, we want to be very much uh, multidisciplinary. For instance, uh, one of the last issues had the whole uh, file, the, the main uh, the, the, the substance of the, the main part of the issue is on uh, the case of gender-based violence, assessing the impact of the international human rights rhetoric on African lives. And, the emphasis on human rights is, of course, well, it's not only American, but he is a very strong American uh, trend. Uh, maybe in relation to the very uh, prominent role of African-American studies in the U.S., uh, there's a heavy emphasis. We are very keen on having uh, African scholars, both uh, Africa-based, but also very much the uh, diaspora. So the editors told me to emphasize this very much. Um, 
We are one of the oldest. We go back to the 50s, three times a year. I think for the rest it's similar to uh, what all the others have said. So I want to be brief. You can always uh, come up to me uh, for more detailed information. But since I'm having the mic, I want to profit from the occasion to uh, uh, talk also about ethnography. Uh, I think many of you uh, will be into ethnography one way or another. I'm the editor also together with Paul Willis of uh, ethnography. If you do, uh, if you feel you do theoretically informed ethnography, that's our slogan, theoretically informed ethnography, you can see also of ethnography. For a change, that's not with Cambridge University Press, that is with SAGE. So you can go onto the website to find more information on ethnography. I think that is all. Yes. If you have more, uh, if you want to have more information on uh, also an African Studies review, you can always come up uh, later. Also. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. So last but very much not least, uh, Claire Mercer is representing uh, the review of African Political Economy. Thank you. Morning, everybody. My name is Claire Mercer. I'm one of the four editors of Review of African Political Economy. And in the interest of time, uh, so that you have the opportunity to ask, I'm going to be very brief. Um, and I just want to draw your attention to what makes ROPE distinctive and what our mission statement is. And I'm going to read it from one of our little postcards. So what makes ROPE distinctive and what we're looking for is uh, papers that try and think about African political economy. We on the editorial working group often have uh, lively debates about what that constitutes. We try and give you some kind of idea of what the kind of papers we're looking for is in our mission statement. And we say that we're interested in radical analysis of trends, issues and social processes in Africa. The journal has paid particular attention to the political economy of inequality, exploitation and oppression whether driven by global forces or local ones, such as class, race, community, and gender. The journal has sustained a critical analysis of the nature of power and the state in Africa. Now, we try and interpret that quite broadly, so if I can just give you a very quick idea of some of the papers that are coming out in the issue that will be published in September, which I recently uh, edited. So, we have a paper that is thinking about uh, current issues in Mali and trying to understand the events that led up to the French intervention in January this year. We have a more historical discussion of the legacy of Thomas Sankara's revolution in Burkina Faso. We also have uh, a paper that's dealing with Delta politics in Nigeria, and we have a paper that is critiquing uh, celebrities and humanitarian intervention in Africa, and particularly in the Great Lakes. So I think that those, just those four papers give you uh, quite a good idea of the breadth of how we interpret our mission statement. The second thing I would say is that we publish papers, but we also publish special issues uh, and briefings. Special issues, uh, one or two a year. Uh, our current uh, edition, sorry, the one before, the one that was just published this week, that came out in March this year, is on uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And last year we had a special issue that was dealing with land grabbing uh, across Africa. Uh, we also publish briefings which are shorter interventions and which often are dealing with very specific and timely issues. So we often have briefings around events, uh, elections, and things like that. And as I say, uh, they're much shorter. So please do take the opportunity to come and talk to uh, myself and some of the other members of the editorial team are here at the conference and we're very uh, open and interested in the things that you might want to propose to publish the road. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. So thank you to uh, all the editors for uh, wonderfully clear uh, presentations of their remits and what makes them uh, particular within the uh, African studies field. Uh, we have now about 25 minutes uh, for questions. Um, the room is such that, and the lights have gone even brighter, that we can barely see at the back of the room, and, and quite possibly we can not hear either. Um, but I shall do my best to uh, gather questions. I was thinking that we might gather uh, a little group of uh, three questions, perhaps, to start with, and to direct these to what you have here, the editors of the leading journals in the field. Uh, so this is a good opportunity to, to raise questions. There indeed is going to be roving mics um, 
uh, to field your questions, so we should actually be able to hear you if we can't see you. So who has a question? For, for this uh, interesting session. Um, my question is uh, not about a specific journal, but I was, I'm myself a student of business and management, and I didn't hear anybody saying something about business and management in journals in Africa or in Africa. Perhaps I might not have listened uh, carefully, but I would like to know which journal focuses on this. Thank you. There's a question behind you. Yeah. Hello, my name is Kies van der Baal, Stellenbosch. I found this uh, presentation session extremely useful and important. And I think it would be very nice if we could ask, uh, if you could consider to make this available on the web, uh, ICA's web perhaps, if the audience agrees and if you agree. Because I think uh, postgraduate students and young scholars and other people would find very pointed, updated statements, extremely useful for developing the publications. Thanks very much for everything that was said. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh, see, I can't see. <laughs> right at the back, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ola from Nigeria. Uh, your presentations sound very impressive. No doubt about that. But one thing I think you should also help us to do, what are the job opportunities for scholars that are interested in working for some of these journals? All of you missed that. You didn't tell us about that. Some of us would like to work on your editorial team. Some of us would like to work with your journal as well. And uh, also, Apart from publishing materials, what efforts are all these journals doing to assist the third world countries in putting together a conference of this magnitude in third world, especially in Africa? Thank you. Thank you very much. My question is on uh, the way papers are reviewed in some of these journals. I know some African scholars have sent papers to some of these journals and uh, they complain, because we in the universities here, they complain so much about uh, the fact that some of these uh, editing styles are Eurocentric in ideas and that uh, the African issues on grounds are not uh, actually taken care of by the reviewers when they are assessing these papers. So the idea is that uh, since Many of you are not on ground in Africa. It's really difficult to review and assess some of these papers, especially when it comes to critical issues on African development. Thank you. I'm from University of Nigeria, Suka, Nigeria. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. So let's uh, ask the panel of experts then to uh, address these questions. Uh, we have one in relation to business and management, uh, another in relation to how to be part of uh, an editorial board or team, uh, uh, and also how to uh, promote uh, uh, access uh, on, in third world countries, uh, and then the final question about um, um, Eurocentric bias and how to review uh, articles uh, if we're not based on ground. Who would like to go first and address one or more? David, please. Thanks. Um, in relation to business and management, I think the sensible thing to do uh, would be to look at the rubric for the different journals in relation to what it is that you're actually um, arguing and what are the debates that you're contributing to. So we do, for example, the Journal of Southern African Studies periodically get papers from people working in management schools or um, whatever. We also get the occasional study which is based very heavily on econometrics. So we are very careful to say we will consider them, but it is in relation to all the things that in fact all of us have been saying in our respective journals about the rubric, the nature of argumentation and the debates and, and how it would fit in. So JSAS, for example, 
um, wouldn't generally publish something that was very heavily econometric, full of formulae and a very mechanistic study, but we would definitely encourage submissions of things that took an econometric study and used that as part of a broader argument that would appeal to our cross-disciplinary um, audience in relation to wider debates. And I think many of the others, certainly as I'm on several other boards as well, would, would respond quite similarly. So we don't automatically in or exclude. It's more a question of the goodness of fit with the sort of style, the focus, the nature of the debates, the balance between empirical and, and broader, maybe more conceptually or theoretically grounded arguments. Is, is, is that helpful? <clears throat> Jason is also um, very conscious of, of the fact that for um, historical reasons, also because of our distinctive way of working as a working board that meets every three or four months um, in person in the manner that, that he has described. Um, and that is why we have an advisory board comprising specialists, many of whom are in Southern Africa um, and other parts of the world, but the majority of people on the editorial board um, either work and visit the region regularly, and many of us are actually from the region and, and travel and are engaged in, in different ways. So we actually feel quite positively that we're not disengaged or disconnected from Africa, but very well um, connected with. What we also do is we help to contribute sponsorship for workshops and conferences, um, particularly if they might lead to submissions of papers or proposals for special issues and part issues. And many of these are held in the region. In fact, most of them are held in the region. And we're also launching um, a JSS biennial conference uh, series starting the year after next. And we have taken the decision that the locations will alternate. So one will be in Southern Africa, one will be in the UK or somewhere else. The third one would then be back in, in the region and so on. So again, that's a way of trying to draw in and integrate. We also, as I said earlier, participate in these writing workshops as a way of helping young scholars um, to move beyond the thesis or the dissertation and produce something that is rounded and engages with the literature in the way that, again, pretty well all the journals here uh, would require. And that reminds me of one other general point that we could add for everybody. What makes a good thesis chapter, or indeed a good consultancy report, if you're a consultant or working for NGO, generally is not the same thing as a good academic article. You might use the material, but please do not just send us chapter X from your dissertation. It needs to be linked to the kind of introductory material you'll have in chapter one, and probably some elements of the conclusions in, in the final chapter, but that it contextualizes and situates the argument. It's not simply a case of I'll send chapter one to this journal, chapter two to that journal, and so on, salami slicing the way through your thesis. You do need to rework it. And that again, if you are in that situation, is the value of these writing workshops that the African Studies Association of the UK and various others are now holding very regularly, not just in Africa, but particularly in Africa, but also in other places and often at conferences like this. Almost all of the editors now want to contribute. Patrick, I saw your hand first. No, yeah. Maybe to add on, um, and again I stress this link between the, the journal and, and the university community we are in. So we have um, some um, institutional support programs with a number of universities in Africa, and we uh, try now to uh, organize on a regular basis what we call write shops to indeed invite young scholars to um, to come and, and participate and and be exposed and already maybe send in at that moment some articles that then will be reviewed by the participants and, and may go in the first stage for a publication. Our own editorial board is international. We try to make it uh, more and more international so that we have uh, African scholars that are either based in Belgium or in their home country. And uh, as for the reports, um, so we have the, uh, the section with the, uh, the articles. But on an on and off basis, we also have uh, what we call reports, where indeed people can uh, maybe present work in progress, um, which is another way of maybe uh, elucidating some um, uh, discussions between scholars and, and the ones in, out there in the field. And because we are open access, 
that may uh, facilitate that kind of discussion. Thanks. Uh, Houston and then Nick. Uh, I just want to add one quick point because it seems to me that the two questions we had, one on promoting access in third world countries, but also the other question about Eurocentric bias, points to a larger issue which affects all of us in this room and particularly all of these journal editors here. And it's really a central issue that points to the legitimacy of African studies, right? Which is how can we have African studies with uh, dominated by journals and scholars uh, in Europe and elsewhere and um, African scholars based on the continent having all sorts of disadvantages in all sorts of ways. And because it's an issue that faces all of us, we're all actually, I think, all the journals are shared in trying to do whatever they can to overcome exactly issues of access to, uh, to journal material, access to publishing, but also much more sort of conceptual issues to do with Eurocentric uh, bias in the pro review processes and so on. And so, in a sense, these kinds of sessions, which are becoming very frequent, um, we should perhaps also think about using these sessions as a means by which where journals can, um, can, can pick up on feedback from scholars in the field. So I'm very grateful about these questions. And I would encourage people to inquire with us and engage with us, because all of us, all of the journals, are involved in all sorts of efforts at all sorts of different levels, together and individually, to overcome these problems of legitimacy because they cut to the heart of what all of us do here. And I would say that even the publishers, Taylor and Francis, for example, who I know closely because of JSAS and Critical African Studies, take, are recognize this issue. And that's why there are all sorts of philanthropic initiatives to make sure that uh, JSAS and, and other Taylor and Francis journals are available for access in some African institutions. And we are aware that some of these uh, initiatives that work well in some contexts but not others and so I think we're all very open to feedback to how does this work, what can we make, do to make this better and therefore I really welcome your questions, would encourage you to engage with us individually but also in group context about these important issues. Thanks, uh, Nick and Wolfgang, did you have anything to add? Nick? Thanks, so, I, mean, I was just going to say basically what you just said but just to add another line, I think um, although the composition of us up here is disappointing from the point of view of African representation, and we would all recognize that. I think if you were to look at the editorial boards, for example, of each of our journals, there's a very heavy African presence. Um, and the other thing that I would like to say is that each of us chooses, I mean, it's slightly different for JSS because they have a board model, um, but the journals that don't have that and simply send articles to peer review, we are incredibly careful about who we send articles to. We would never send an article to someone who didn't have real in-depth experience. I mean, in general, when, we, when we're sending an article to someone to be reviewed, this person has spent two or three years on the ground, they've published journal articles, maybe books on the topic in the country that we're talking about. Very, very frequently, those reviewers will be Africans and African institutions themselves. So I think although the editorial uh, panel here may look very Eurocentric, the actual review process is often not that Eurocentric. We have many reviewers in America, many reviewers in Africa, and we are always trying to pick for people who have experience on the ground. Now, of course, they're not necessarily people who are always living on the ground, but they are people who've spent a long, you know, long time intensely trying to understand local issues on the ground from the perspective of African states, African leaders, African political actors. So I think on that side, perhaps, there's a lot more African involvement in the editorial process than there may appear to be from the panel today. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that uh, it is uh, it's fair to say that among all the journals represented here, there is a sort of inbuilt uh, attitude of, of actually you know, positive racism almost among the editors in the sense that if you get a paper submitted by an African author, um, I think quite commonly, um, most of us would, would be willing to say that you know, we go the extra length to really try and uh, see, you know, can we get this one out? Um, just because we know of the things that African authors, Africa-based authors are dealing with, also in terms of technical things there. You know, I mean, you will definitely check up email-wise if you haven't heard back for three weeks because you know, maybe it ended up in the spam folder or the account broke down. There's all kinds of micromanagement, things like that, that we're quite aware of and that we're really trying to go the extra length. Uh, to, to, to make sure that African authors can contribute in our current uh, edition of Creative African Studies, half the authors are African, based in Africa. Um, this linking to the question of uh, how do you get on uh, the editorial team, um, apart from being white, Caucasian and based in the UK, <laughs> 
which definitely helps, it seems. Um, well, um, showing up at a conference like this and you know talking in person is most certainly uh, uh, a very, very important step in becoming an editor because it is, after all, very much a close cooperation between a very small number of people who all have too much to do. And it is not actually a very nice job always to be an editor, uh, certainly not always very rewarding in terms of how much time goes into things, although I find it very rewarding personally. So you should, if you want to build some kind of relationship with people that will need to trust you and that you will need to trust to be able to do that kind of work, that really still works in terms of eye contact, handshake, having a good feeling and getting stuff done. <laughs> so talk to us. Thanks. So I think we have time now for uh, another round of questions. Uh, if there are any in the room. Do I see any hands? Yes. So, a roving mic, please, to... There we go. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Jonas Evald from University in, in Sweden. I asked a technical question, uh, and that's about the, the ranking system and impact system and open access. How does that work? Is the, the material you are publishing uh, on, is on open access, or that is published as some, I understand, you also get some extra stuff, uh, published extra material. I don't know the term you use, but which could be put on the, the web. As well, how is that ranked in, in a, a journal uh, which that, that are ranked, but it's published? In order to make the question clear, is all material in an ISS ranked journal is that having the same type of, of standing? If eventually published in hard copies or uh, available as open access? Okay, thank you. I think we understood that. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, one more. Hello again. Um, I, I think you can skip my answering my question if it is if, if it seems a bit provocative. Uh, my impression. I live in Sweden. I am from Eritrea, and um, I think the, the editorial uh, presentations here are very good in trying to know how what things are done at the journal level, publication level. But I am also a bit, uh, I would like to also know or find people from Africa or Africans living in Europe as part of this group who present journals as editors or members or editorial team. Uh, it seems that this is European for Europeans. Uh, I'm sorry for this word, but why are no people um, diverse enough to, in, even in this publication? Uh, uh, publication sphere, so I just wonder why we, we don't have any applicants in the group. Okay, thank you. And then one last question just behind that. Thank you for your, for your presentation. Um, two journals mentioned that there are no fees for authors, so I wonder how the other journals tackle this, if there are fees for authors or not. Okay, thanks. So, effectively, we've got uh, one question which revisits prior set of uh, issues that we've tried to address, and then we've got two questions that are around author processing charges and, and open access. Perhaps the open access journals might want to say something, and Martin might want to chip in on some of the technical points. Um, yeah, I think the first question, um, if, I, if I understood correctly, you were asking about um, what material is indexed and what material contributes or uh, to uh, you know impact factors. Um, and we've talked a lot about online material here. Um, so. First, I would say that all, I think all the journal 
girls here um, are very good at making material freely available, which is something that is different to open access. Um, and many of the journals here also publish companion material with an article. Africa is a very good example of this. Um, now, in terms of what material around that article is um, citable and will be indexed and, and counted by the beam counters who calculate impact factors, um, it is the journal article. It is not the supplementary material. Um, so, so that, I think, is, I hope, answers one part of your question. And then, uh, so the sort of free access, open access issue perhaps should turn to now. Um, so we, we're, we're lucky here, we have a couple of uh, fully open access journals here. Um, but I would say that all of the journals here do have uh, roots to enable an author to make his or her work open access. So you can publish your work in the traditional route. Um, it will be published perhaps in a subscription-based journal. It may, uh, be, you know, it will be published print and online. Um, but, and, and, the, and there is no fee involved whatsoever for um, the, the author or the author's funding body. Um, but there are ways in which that work can be put in the public domain in an open access uh, way, and we call that green open access or archiving. Um, and I would in encourage you to, you know, it, it's taken me about six years to get my head around open access and I, you know, eat it for breakfast, it's my job sort of thing, I have to. It's complicated um, and, you know, speak to people about it. Most of, uh, you know, most publisher websites now have made a great effort to explain very clearly what rights authors have, what to do, what they can do with their work, um, how they can go about making their work open access. Um, so I would encourage you to, to look at, at the websites to you know, start to, we, you know, we need to continue to educate ourselves about open access because it is a very difficult, uh, complex field. There's a lot of jargon and there's a lot of misunderstanding between free access, open access, green, gold, author fees, you know. Uh, so so I'll, I'll just stop there and perhaps someone else might chip in about um, other forms of open access. Just very briefly, it was basically Africa Focus and Africa Spectrum who mentioned that there are no author fees. And we say that because there are actually open access journals who do charge authors fees. But we opted for open access systems that don't. Thank you. Any other contributions from the panel? Wolfgang and Peter, just briefly. Actually, uh, I just have my hand up because I, I keep seeing that Daryl and Dory, if they're from Taylor Francis, is kind of sort of maybe ready to say something, but maybe he's too shy. To, but he would be the kind of person actually who has quite a lot of deeper insight. that we addressed uh, the question in the first round about conferences on Africa 
of the gentlemen all there in the back. I, I can't see you, but <laughs> I see you waving. Yeah. And I think it's, it's an imp a very important question about uh, Congress, is about Africa taking place here and not in Africa itself. And it, I think it relates also to the, the situation about journals and all that. So, I think it's a very important question because it, it, it continues and it is a very strange situation. I'm Dutch and in the main conference on Holland would take place in the United States, I would be really surprised. I think one way of addressing the issue is uh, in a kind of comparative, <laughs> is in a kind of uh, comparative uh, perspective. For instance, it, it's very striking that the situation for uh, South Asia changed considerably that I mean the main conferences on India on India studies are taking place in India or you could compare to uh, conferences in the United States on French literature there are such conferences but it's quite clear that the main conference on French literature or French studies or whatever are taking place in France so why has there been a shift in the Indian studies for instance and why not in Africa studies I, I think that that I'm, I'm, it's not a real answer, but I think it's important to look at it in comparative perspective. Why certain shifts in the kind of power relations in academic context take place, for instance, for South, South Asia, even for Southeast Asia, there's a kind of change in the balance, and not for Africa. It's not an answer, but I mean, I, I, I want to emphasize that we have to address that question. We have to continue to address that question, and that comparative perspective the last word from David. I just wanted to respond to the final question, which was not answered by the, the previous responses. And I think the essential thing to understand is that to produce a journal in whatever form costs money, it takes resources. So the traditional model was that the costs are borne by people who pay subscriptions institutionally and individually to journals. The idea of the different open access models are there are different ways of doing that usually from authors. So I think that's the critical thing. Where journals are able to publish open access without charges means, in effect, they are able to obtain subsidies or funding from trusts or foundations or perhaps from core funds of the universities or institutions concerned that cover those editorial costs, the costs of the web platform for hosting the online systems and so on. There is no such thing as a free journal in the sense of producing it being free. That's the essential issue. But as it changes so rapidly, each and every journal is discussing and trying to position itself. And you know, in our editorial board meetings, this is an ongoing, not a closed discussion. Thank you very much. And on that note, I'm afraid we're out of time. So let me close this session by thanking you all very much for coming, thanking my colleagues for their wonderful contributions. Uh, let me invite you to take this opportunity to come and meet the editors at this juncture and to help yourself to the publicity material here. Thank you very much.